Okay, Baltimore City Council Ways and Means Committee, we're back in session for City Council Bill 23-0381, Ordinance of Estimates for the Fiscal Year Ending June 30, 2024. Mayor Costello, Councilman from the 11th District, Chair of the Committee, uh, joined to my uh, immediate right by Tony, staff to the committee. We have representatives from Mayor Scott and Council President Mosby's office, offices, respectively, here with us today. Uh, we are here for Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success, Mayor's Office of African American Male Engagement, and Family League of Baltimore. Uh, Dr. Brooks, we're gonna start off with you. Uh, before we get started, a couple quick housekeeping items. Uh, we have this new technology in council chambers. Uh, when you are speaking, please press the button on the bottom right. It looks like the little person with the Wi-Fi signal next to their ear. That will turn your microphone on. This thing will be red. When you're Finish speaking, please turn it off. These microphones are very sensitive, so they will pick up breathing, sniffles, whispers, and any other small noises uh, that we make. Um, I'm gonna ask each of the three agency directors, so when we start with Dr. Brooks, if you could introduce everyone uh, who's here from your team, uh, first and last name and position title, run through your presentation. Dr. Bunley, we'll get to you. Damon, then we'll get to you, do the same. Um, that's it, let's go. All right, good morning. I'm Dr. Deborah Brooks, Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success. To my right, I have Chris Quintine, who is the Chief of Staff for the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success. Directly behind me is Angela Whitaker, who is the Director of the Baltimore City CAP Center's Community Action Partnership. And to Angela's uh, right is Sharon uh, Barrows, who is the Director of Head Start for the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success. Are we ready to begin? All right, so again, good morning this uh, today. And I'm gonna just start with a brief overview. Again, our mission uh, is here on the screen, but I just wanna specifically point out that the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success works um, to organize other city agencies in collaboration with state agencies and community and nonprofit agencies to really partner in delivery um, an ecosystem that supports and uplifts our youth with particular focus on children and young men of, and women of color and strengthens families by improving educational attainment and socioeconomic mobility. Um, you're gonna hear us talk a great deal today about our robust youth engagement programming uh, as a focus for our 2024 goals, but also a, a number of robust engagement opportunities that we've provided uh, thus far, as well as reimagining some of the supports and resources that are being provided through our CAP centers, as well as our Head Start programs that we have. I just wanna share that um, so far during this uh, 2023 year, we have engaged um, so many of our youth over a number of activities. To begin with our youth voter registration, which we engage with 10 schools and over 800 students, um, just really going out into our high schools and engaging them around registering to vote, the importance of voting and their voices being heard. We also stood up the first of our annual Lead Hership during Women's History Month in March, where we engaged over 100 young women um, both in middle and high schools, where we had a diverse panel of female professionals. We also had food and vendors. Um, the young ladies were able to meet with um, professionals across a wide range of professions to include law enforcement, entrepreneurs, um, educators, and really begin to engage in conversations as they begin to make career choices for themselves. We also stood up for the first time ever our teen spring break camp. Um, we heard from young people to say that there really was not a lot for them to do over the spring break. And so we were able to register over 300 youth to engage uh, in activities across four rec centers as we partnered with Baltimore City Rec and Park, where they received free food. There was free registration, engaging activities to include swimming, movies, uh, silent disco, laser tag, uh, basketball, dance, as well as arts and crafts. 
So those were just a few of what we have done thus far, but as we continue to provide robust youth engagement programming um, to include a number of the summer uh, activities, um, as we also continue to meet and hear our voices of our young people, um, we stood up uh, activity over the Memorial Day weekend, uh, Rashfield in partnership with MOAM, uh, where we had over 200 young people as well and their families to engage in uh, activities. And as we focus this summer on engage, connect, and be more, um, listening to what our young people uh, want to have um, activities that they want to engage in. So we will continue to work very closely uh, with our young people to stand up activities that they're interested in um, so that we can make sure that they're engaging in appropriate activities. Also, as we move forward to re-engage some of the supports that we have at our CAP centers, um, yes, the focus has been, as we know, with, our, with the pandemic around eviction prevention, as well as water for all and energy assistance. We also want to provide additional supports around GED programming, financial literacy for our families, partnering with the health department on mater maternal health care, uh, and just really also hearing from our communities additional supports, uh, adding additional supports for our seniors, um, listening to how we can better support them as well, and then continuing to provide um, supports at our Head Start programming and partnering with Baltimore City Public Schools to ensure that all of our young people are ready for kindergarten. The next slide uh, just shows uh, the different areas in our office. And then the next slide just talks about our major budget items. Uh, I do want to call out that the recommended budget includes $100,000 in one-time support for the summer programming that I did uh, just briefly speak about as we stand up engagement for our young people. Um, MOCFS provides financial support to organizations that offer some summer programming for youth across the city. And as we do partner, uh, with Baltimore's promise and summer collaboration to really determine what gaps we may have across the city as we look, about, look around what parts of the city may need additional summer programming or what age groups to make sure that we're targeting uh, summer programming for all of our young people. For Head Start, the budget increases funding for a contract that provides technical assistance to the to the program by uh, 138,000. Uh, the contract includes personnel to provide training and monitoring of the program related to early childhood education, mental health, and students with disabilities because we want to make sure that we're providing equitable programming for all of our young people. As we look at our performance measures, uh, we continue to uh, work towards increasing our enrollment for our young people. Uh, and ensuring, again, that we have our young people ready for kindergarten. Uh, as you can see, our enrollment is uh, going back to pre-pandemic levels, and we will continue to strive to have full enrollment in our Head Starts. And then for our CAP centers, again, uh, we have been focusing on uh, eviction prevention. Uh, the mayor has allocated an additional $5 million. Um, to be able to continue to support our eviction prevention as we know uh, that the need continues to be even um, though uh, we know that we are moving out of the pandemic. Uh, we are continue to work with our state partners as well as our federal um, partners to uh, uh, ask for additional funding in this area. Uh, but we do continue to uh, provide support uh, as you can see, uh, the number of families uh, that we have been able to um, support, uh, over 12,000 to support in this area. Um, the recommended budget transfers, an operational assistant three position, um, as well as we continue to work closely in ensuring that all of our vacancies are filled to be able to continue to support the constituents in this uh, area as well. And that's all that we have if you have any questions.
Thank you. Um, we'll hold questions until we've gone through all three agencies. We've also been joined by Council Vice President Sharon Green Middleton, 6th District Member of the Committee, and Councilwoman Danny McCrae, 2nd District Member of the Committee, uh, as well as Deputy Mayor Dr. Giraza. Dr. Bunley, the floor is yours. Or we could do Family League just as well if those slides are up. That's fine. Forgot housekeeping rule number one. Turn on the mic. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Damon Millard, CEO of Family League of Baltimore. Uh, so pleased to join you this morning. Uh, Family League of Baltimore, for the past 30 years, has served as the uh, local management board of Baltimore City. Uh, that primarily is in terms of supporting uh, children and family youth programming and leveraging and braiding uh, state as well as federal as well as private dollars uh, in support of programs within the city. Uh, we really take our role from a standpoint of helping build capacity and technical assistance uh, for our partners. In fiscal year 2022, uh, we granted over $21 million to over 80 partners, uh, supporting over 25 families as well as their uh, children. Uh, our mission as we engaged in a strategic planning process has been based on work that we've done with Morgan State University School of Community Health and Policy in which a community health needs assessment was done through a uh, racial equity lens uh, with a, a specific focus on social determinants of health. With that, we were able to, one, uh, comprise a, a, a new mission statement, really looking at ways of how do we continue to collaborate with community-based partners, but also utilizing data-informed, community-driven solutions uh, that align those resources that I mentioned earlier and braiding them to dismantle systemic barriers that impact children, families, and communities. As we're going into this fiscal year, our major goals that we're looking at is one, standing up our community advisory board. Uh, that is one of the key steps that we're taking one in terms of a space of uh, participatory budgeting, but also how do we actually operationalize equity. I want to thank you all for uh, who provided recommendations for uh, members to serve as a part of that community advisory board in which they will be undergoing a level of training. One, in terms of having an overview of that community health needs assessment from Morgan State, but also engaging the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond to have a opportunity to know how to unpack uh, issues as it relates to a power analysis uh, within those uh, respective community areas. We look at having representatives from each council district uh, throughout the city so that way uh, each of the uh, respective neighborhoods and communities would be represented on the board. We're also excited about deepening our work in the area of community schools as well as out of school time programming. As you know, for over the past decade, we have served as one of the major uh, partners uh, in collaboration with city schools as well as the mayor's office in supporting the community school strategy. We co-chair the community school steering committee uh, with city schools, but this year will be a little bit different uh, because of the blueprint uh, to uh, uh, for Maryland's success and Maryland's future, uh, we're able to, one, leverage uh, some of the funding that has been provided as a part of the Concentrations of Poverty grant program that any school that is considered to be 80% uh, uh, free and reduced price meals would therefore be deemed as a community school by way of state uh, policy. So we're going to be able to leverage one Maryland City Council funding to go a little bit deeper in terms of out of school time programming. Uh, one, hopefully making a more uh, seats accessible in terms of high quality programs with out of school time. We want to thank uh, Dr. Brooks, who's been a part of those conversations uh, with city schools. So instead of doing 44 schools, which we have done historically within uh, the city, uh, now that will now go down to nine schools in which Family League will be directly supporting with city investments. And so you ask, well, why just the nine schools? Well, these are the schools that were because of some of the counts by way of the poverty index uh, that's utilized. Uh, essentially would be able to slip through the cracks. So these are uh, majority students who are where English is their second language. And so we wanted to make sure that these schools would still be able to have uh, community school resources and coordinators to provide that support. 
And lastly, one of the key goals is the work that we do with uh, the health department as a part of the Be More for Healthy Babies uh, collective impact strategy. Uh, we're obviously providing that support with maternal and child health home visiting programs, which provide uh, uh, intensive case management support uh, and utilize uh, evidence-based practice, uh, such as the Healthy Families Americas program. So. We've also been uh, having a foray in terms of making sure that in our, uh, early childhood learning, uh, in which we've been able to utilize another evidence-based program called the HIPPIE program, uh, home-based uh, instruction for parents of preschool youngsters, in which now Family League is a license holder for the HIPPIE program, and now having the opportunity to not only spread their program from Park Heights, but leverage it and scale that to other areas, such as Bel Air Edison, as well as Cherry Hill. The two service areas uh, that we receive funding from the city, uh, specifically a service number 3385A, uh, uh, which is a health and wellness grant, uh, as well as service number 446, which is a community school uh, and education, uh, uh, education uh, mayoralty uh, program. Uh, prioritizing our youth, I touched on this earlier in terms of the uh, maternal and child health home uh, uh, home uh, visiting programs. So the three, uh, four main partners that we work in this space uh, is Sinai Hospital, uh, Drew Mondaman uh, Family Services, The Family Tree, and Roberta's House, which provides uh, interconception care. So these are mothers who experience uh, infant loss and are able to support families uh, through the grieving process. With these uh, dollars, we're also able to leverage uh, state investment and funding through MSDE. Uh, as well as the Maryland Department of Health to support this network in terms of making sure that outreach is done to families uh, who uh, are in, uh, uh, in the process of pregnancy, as well as postpartum supports uh, for uh, those mothers as well. As you see, in terms of the numbers, we have been trending pretty steadily, uh, in which our target is for fiscal year 24 uh, to support 340 families. Uh, the other measure that we use in terms of uh, success has been the number of children that uh, undergo the ages and stages uh, questionnaire and screening, which is in terms of social and emotional development and support, in which we're also on track for that, it's 92%. The educational grant 446 is the investment that I spoke of earlier in terms of the community schools program at 25,300 uh, students Basically, that is the enrollment of the students that have been served not only within uh, those schools that are part of the network, but also the after-school programs that we support. The average daily attendance uh, performance measure number is at 75% in terms of those young people who attend those programs are at least 75% likely throughout the school year of attending on a regular basis. Uh, thank you for your time, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Uh, we've also been joined by Councilman Mark Conway, 4th District, and Councilman Chris Burnett, 8th District member of the committee. Uh, Dr. Brooks, uh, with the reduction in federal funding of about $10 million for eviction protection, can you talk about um, what plans, if any, the agency has to continue to provide support and services in that area? Yes, I'll begin and then I'll ask Angela, uh, the director of uh, the CAP centers to, to join in. So again, um, we have been partnering with our state partners, other um, counties across the state, um, as we are um, requesting additional funds from the state as well, as well as we've reached out to our federal uh, partners to ask for reallocated funds for additional funding. Um, we've also um, been uh, utilizing the additional funds that we received from the uh, mayor, the additional $5 million to support uh, those um, applications that we currently have in queue um, to continue to support families uh, that have uh, placed applications for this additional assistance as well. And I'll turn it over to Angela as well. Good morning. Um, in addition to what Dr. Brooks described, we are also partnering with other um, agencies across the city who provide similar work so that we can do some resource and referral work. And then we are also working with the constituency to do some preventative work around case management and employment development with the hopes of seeing less of our constituents needing the supports through eviction prevention. 
Thank you, Dr. Brooks and Ms. Whitaker. Uh, Council Vice President Middleton and colleagues, we're gonna do um, one question uh, for this round. Uh, and after VP Middleton, Councilwoman McCray, Councilman Conway, Councilman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. And um, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm so sorry. And turn it over to you, Doc. Please press the uh, the red button. Madam VP, I'm so sorry. That is okay. This is one of the most important presentations. Yes, it is. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and other members of this uh, August P um, committee. Uh, I'd like to thank you for giving us an opportunity to share. I'd like to, uh, before I get into the presentation, acknowledge Ms. Tracy Estep, who is the Senior Operation Manager of the Mayor's Office of African American Male Engagement. <clears throat> uh, very small office. Can you hear me? Very small office, um, but is uh, getting strengthened uh, um, by the month. Um, we have been doing, uh, we believe, some good work. Um, I would just like to guess, kind of share with you uh, some information pertaining to that work. This office was started in uh, year 2018. Um, very small office, we're about five of us at the time. Um, and what we did was we said that we wanted to be very intentional and impactful uh, in, in the process of our work. So we created what was called Mission 186. Mission 186, or sometimes called M186. Uh, basically, Mission 186 was when we looked at the data, there were approximately 186,000 African-American males between the ages of five all the way up to uh, somewhat close to my age now. Um, and so what we wanted to do in that process, and um, Councilwoman Middleton was in there at the beginning, what we wanted to do in that process was to get everybody involved in the process of helping African-American men uh, and those others who um, were a part of that, that number, because we're very intentional about boys and young men of color, but we're not exclusive, we're very inclusive. But we wanted to make certain that everybody had a positive and constructive pathway forward. And in doing that, that when we said everybody, we talked about the individuals who were in prison, the individuals such as Damon Millard who were in positions of authority. We were talking about our partners, lawyers, everybody. And so if you were not feeling positive and constructive, uh, which is the opposite, feeling negative and destructive, we wanted to make certain that those who felt like they were thriving to be involved in their lives. And so we came up with that process. Uh, we expanded our focus to boys and young men of color. Um, and so in that process of, of expanding to boys and young men of color, we later the next, in the next year after the office opened, um, the Squeegee Initiative came into our portfolio. And with the Squeegee Initiative, one of the best things that we did, and it has a, I think it has um, some good insight for the future, is that the at that time, the deputy mayor convened what she called a collaborative of individuals who had an interest in ensuring that our young people felt, knew that they didn't have to squeegee and scrounge for money on corners. Um, and so the collaborative approach has yielded us some good results. <clears throat> and so I just want to uh, uh, pause there and say that with the collaborative, one of the things that we're seeing, we're seeing the young people begin to thin out at these corners where they are squeegeeing. Some of the summer is just be beginning and we, s we have still have more work to do. But they're not thinning out because of some just direct enforcement by police officers. They're thinning out because we are individualizing our approach and we're getting to know those young people by name and by need. And once you know them by name and by need, you can put them on a positive and constructive pathway forward, which is, again, the mission of our office. So we're excited about that, and it has some 
um, view for what we know we have to do, which is the other thing that we're doing in our office. Our other approach is we're working with youth violence reduction. We're pushing into that process. You heard my colleague talk about earlier the collaboration that the mayor is requiring between the agencies. And so with youth violence reduction, again, we're looking at this whole idea of a collaborative uh, individuals who are interested in youth violence reduction. Because one of the things that we know, if you want to be successful in the process, you have to have individuals who have a keen or a, or, or a serious interest in a particular issue. So we're working to do that as well. And the biggest piece of it all, and my colleagues can attest, is that partnerships with other individuals, even as we have to collaborate as it pertains to the curfew centers. Again, partnership is important. If you're gonna have individuals outside, you have to have partners, again, who have keen interests in being outside one o'clock in the morning. Individuals who are not who, who, who have a feeling of being safe working in that process. So we are big on partnerships in Moaim, but across the board. The major program or process, excuse me, in working with our young people, we have what we call connect to success. And that's what we've done with the squeegee youth, connect them to success. Again, constructive and positive pathway forward. As we expand to look at other youth, again, we have to use this connect to success process. But there are a couple of features that are important in the connect to success process. The reason that our young people in the squeegee process have had little involvement, and you haven't heard them uh, there being an issue between police and our young people is because of our monitors. We have outreach workers who are in the space where our youngsters are. So we anticipate where they're going to be so that we minimize or, or slash reduce the interaction with police officers that's inappropriate. So we know strategically where our youngsters are and so we send our outreach workers to that space to make certain that that's a that they are there for our youngsters and they become credible mentors in the lives of those uh, individuals. Again, we bring them into wraparound services, individualizing an the approach to support them. This is just a slide of structural hierarchy. Going back to, uh, again, in 2018, when we started the office, um, we started the office um, with a, a, a very small budget, but when you look at the uh, FY24, here's what we're, where we are in terms of our budget, uh, the numbers you see on the screen. I will say, again, when we started the office, we started with a very small staff, but we had 21 outreach workers at that time. You remember those, uh, Councilwoman Middleton, um, who were up, we called them fishermen. Once again, those partners are individuals who have the wherewithal to be in the space and have an interest of being in the space where our young people are. You have to have those individuals. What we're doing now as we evolve and we look at the work going forward, we have had to now reconfigure those positions and so what was once 21 part-time positions of individuals uh, out there, we're now seeing it, it's, it, it's, it makes sense to create four full-time positions and three part-time positions. All right, and so that's the, the evolution of, of where we are, but we also see now a need for an expansion and so I'd like to thank the mayor for the $1 million in ARPA funds that was given. And so as we look forward, we are now looking to hire, again, to do the work that I've been describing, four navigators. And again, those are individuals who, who work in the office, who assist us as we expand our partnerships. 
um, because we're looking to expand into youth violence. And so we have to push into that process. So we have to expand to be able to manage the data um, in our uh, data management system. So we have four navigators, but we also have, uh, we're looking to hire two communication specialists. What uh, we're looking, we're working on right now in the office as it pertains to um, the youth that squeegee on corners, we're working on a public service announcement. And, and again, that public service announcement uh, is coming, we're working, pulling it together, but we don't have the specialist yet to help us with our messaging and showing our progress of how our youngsters are doing wonderful things. So we're working on uh, attaining those positions. And then, I think this is the last slide. If you look at the last slide, we, uh, this office, when we started, we were under mayoralty, and then in the second year, we, we became part of the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success. And then under uh, the Scott's administration, they broke it back out to be a standalone office, um, the Mayor's Office of African American Male Engagement. But if you look at the data that we have to send to Family League, specifically we did this with, in conjunction with Family League, the number of youth enrolled in our Connect to Success program, uh, and, um, FY22, we targeted to get 100 individuals, and we were able to get 140 individuals. Uh, of those engaged currently in school, we, our targets was 100, because when we disaggregate, let me just stop there. When we look at our youth that we are engaging, boys and young men of color, particularly in this squeegee realm, um, you have individuals who are school age young people, and these are individuals who have declared and they are still part of school based on what their parents are saying and based on their behavior that they're going to school. And then we have what we call, we call those say, school age young people, school age youth. And then we have our NSA, non-school age youth. The non-school age youth have declared through their demonstration that they're just done with school. And so when we look at those individuals, that's how we break out and do the work with them considering their status. If you, all of those youngsters, if you look at the third measure uh, below, all of our young people have to do what we call personal growth plans, right? A lot of people, you hear people talking about finding their why, right? It's very important that young people get an opportunity to articulate where they want to be. And it's very important for us to facilitate their mastery and their practice. And they really, what we're finding is that they have a penchant toward wanting to be somebody and be professional, just as we see that our youngsters do in sports. We see our youngsters in sports and we see that they uh, think about going pro, whether it be football, basketball, uh, and tennis and the like, rapping. But we now also know that they, those individuals whom we've helped just help, we've helped them to get jobs. They want to be professionals at the jobs that they that they have attained that they thought they could never attain. Um, and so they want to they want to become pros at that as well. So what, that's one of the things that we we're seeing in this process. So personal growth plans are very very important. When we look at our non-school age youth at the fourth measure down, we, uh, we targeted in uh, FY22, uh, our goal was 37 individuals. We, re we were able to get uh, 47, and, and for the non-school age, we targeted 63. We were able to uh, get uh, uh, 78, and if you look at the FY23, it's the same thing in, 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 in process. Now, once, if you all are looking closely, you'll say the numbers don't add up. And let me just say before you get there, we have gotten individuals into the process, but they have voted with their feet away from the process. We don't give up on them. We go back and get them. But some of them just don't feel, um, I guess, the strength or the interest to stay engaged in the process. So. Um, 
that concludes uh, my thoughts about our office, and uh, I will take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Bundley. We are going to start with Vice President Middleton. Um, colleagues, just to set the expectations, we are doing one question. Um, I, as a chair, I will allow one follow-up question um, with your question. And you have the floor, Vice President Middleton. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. If I could all just do a quick comment. I'd like to do a quick comment just because I'm very much involved in um, many of the activities from, from this office. And my comment is first, I just have to thank the Office of Family and Children's Success. I have to thank the Family League and thank you, um, Dr. Bunley, with the Office of uh, African American uh, Male Engagement. Um, Jess have been involved with um, all of this agency and all of these offices uh, intimately because of the uh, problems, uh, not just within Park Heights, but throughout, throughout the city. And um, I just can't say thank you enough. The services that you render are so important and needed. And, um, you know, it's just sad that we, have to continue to fight for money in areas where, uh, you know, we really want to do the, the great impact. And I'm grateful to hear that you've reached out to the state and, and federal partners. Um, I, with the Family League, the, um, I know you mentioned the Hippie program and how uh, that has been, it, it really kind of started in Park Heights, and it is, and I'm glad to hear that it is expanding, because it uh, part of the problems that we are uh, having today with our young people as well. There's problems within the home, and this program helps that most of the time single parent connect with. Uh, the schools that these children go to and help the, guide them into being uh, parents and teaching them how to help educate their children. And I've seen it, I've seen success firsthand. So that is a, a, a wonderful plus. And also your community advisory board, you have, um, you know, I give credit to your leaders, your team, of course, but your leadership in staying on task with uh, all the goals and performance measures that the city uh, creates, you know, every year as they do their evaluations. Uh, the same with the, the CAP centers. Um, you continue to stay on task. Um, and then I'll just, I can go through everything that you did, but I am a, a proud supporter and champion and with you, uh, Dr. Bunley, taking on that squeegee initiative and um, you see it's been kind of quiet now and, and I heard in your voice as you said, human, these are humans as well and they have been through uh, their products of the difficult and times and struggles that we have in our neighborhoods and thank you for continuing to stay on that task. We don't say thank you enough, so I'm in the, I'm in the thank you mood. Um, so my quick question, um, I'm hoping that the Security Deposit Relief Act that's connected with the eviction programs and whatever, are, is, are there, is funding there to continue that act? Because all of that is connected with um, helping to keep our uh, people that are struggling from being evicted. Yes, as we continue our eviction prevention work security deposit is still in that um, programming portfolio. So we're still um, offering security deposit and as we continue to hopefully get additional funds that will remain in the portfolio. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me do a little comment there. You're the only one. I'm gonna let do a little comment. <laughs> so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna try to be as brief as I can. Um, 
And I'm going to say thank you, guys. I don't say thank you that often, but I'm going to give somebody their roses. Dr. Brooks, I appreciate you, and I appreciate your team. Um, you guys are always responsive. I can't think of one time that you guys have not got back and actually saw an issue all the way through from my office, and it's not, um, it's not too many agencies that have your success rates, so I thank you, and I definitely thank your team um, as well. I wanna start with the guaranteed income pilot, and I think I see Allie Smith in here back there. Within um, Mayor Scott's announcement highlighting a new dashboard displaying our city's guaranteed income pilot demographic data in September of 2022, Mayor Scott noted that Baltimore's participant spending data would be included in the next quarterly update of the dashboard. Um, my question is, has the spending data for the Baltimore Young Family Success Fund, our guaranteed income pilot, has it been, um, is it available? Um, or has any additional information been updated since that September 29th release? And if not, when will it be updated? Thanks, Allie. Ms. Smith. Thank you for the question. Good morning. Um, the spending data has not been uploaded to the dashboard. When we met with um, one of the evaluation partners, we learned that the data that they were collecting was very incomplete and would not have shown accurate spending data. So we have opted not to utilize that and instead will be relying on the larger evaluation that we are working with as part of the pilot. This will be my follow-up, you all. Um, knowing that we're almost a year into the program, mm -hmm. um, what additional information can we expect to see? Um, just outside of the demographic and spending data and even though what you guys have um, right now is incomplete, when can you expect that we have the spending data? I'm just thinking of a um, WYPR report. I think it was Tanea Moore with um, Cash Campaign who was talking about how they're able to track um, the spending with the debit cards. Um, they can't track it if you're doing something, um, if you're paying your rent with checks but with the debit card. So when would we have that data and when would we have any additional data? And also what additional data can we look forward to? Absolutely. Yeah, so to that point, the spending data that they have been collecting, like you said, is just through the bank account where they put the deposits, which can show spending from beyond the payments that they're receiving. And like you said, excludes anything paid by check or cash cash, which we know is most often how you pay your rent, so that is completely missed. But the first batch of our quantitative surveys from our evaluation partner, Apton Associates, went out in January and February of this year, so they're currently going through those, and all final, output, all final reports on outcomes will be released um, in the year 2024 and then 2025, but a, we do have some more narrative data that we've been tracking as well around things such as, would you like, do you wanna hear a couple of the items? I would love to. Okay. We would love to. Okay. So during the onboarding process, the Cash Campaign of Maryland helped around 40 people open a bank account. So there's 200 total participants in the pilot program. Um, 30 of these participants requested to use our financial disbursement partner's debit card. They helped eight people set up their first email accounts. Um, many of participants we see have improved their housing and working circumstances. For example, uh, one mother in the program was working three part-time positions when the pilot began, and now she has secured a full-time position in the field that she would like to pursue. So she's available to be with her children and family more often. There were 26 participants who identified as unhoused when the program began, and we have confirmed that those in the cohort have found secure housing. Um, for example, one person will be able to move, has moved from a one bedroom to a two bedroom apartment and they had three children so that expansion has really benefited the family. The cash campaign receives about three letters per week from leasing offices to verify participants' income so they continue to um, become more stably housed. 
One participant has used her money to enroll in classes to become a flight attendant. And we've also seen and heard some examples of positive shifts on mental health and stress where families are able to cover large expenses. It's having positive impact on their family relationships and they've also been able to help connect them to other services like our unhoused participants I mentioned earlier. Thank you. I'm going to stick to, I'm excited. I have some more questions about the program, but um, I'm going to stick to the, to the rule and I'm going to go to council member Burnett. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so my question, um, one, I just wanted to give credit where it's due um, to uh, CEO Leach uh, and uh, your leadership on the Squeegee Collaborative and everybody that was a part of that. I know a lot of folks in the room have been there from day one, I mean, really pulling this thing together. And I think it's, um, you know, as I drive through the city, uh, I'm often looking to see where the, the success is, and it's one of those things where it's like no news is good news uh, because we, we are seeing le less people squeegeeing. Um, and I think, you know, it's a testament to that very strategic work that you all underwent uh, with a lot of stakeholders and a lot of moving parts, but I think the success is showing. So I just want to thank all of you for, for that because I know a lot of you were, a lot of folks in this room were leading that. Um, can someone speak to, uh, I guess, the, one of the questions we get is folks uh, aging out of the sort of target age group from that, that 16 to 24. Um, can we speak to, I guess, what, what sort of uh, handoffs or additional services are we like trying to push sort of the older, older um, young, young adults, I would say, uh, who are you know, a little outside of that window, um, but obviously still need additional support? One of the, the again, um, thanks, uh, Councilman Burnett, for that question. When we, we talked about the individualization of those youngsters, we start out with a personal growth plan. And in that personal growth plan, individuals have to articulate what their interest is and where they'd like to be, what, how they would get to their why. And so we carry them all the way through. So as we look at individuals aging out, aging up, we, for example, if Hopefully, we'll get them to a place, let's use this as an example, to DPW. And once they get to DPW, then we just have our check-ins with them. Um, so uh, the goal is, is and, and then we also are available upon their return. That's one of the things that we found, and, and that's just another nugget in the process. When our young people make mistakes, they are harder on themselves than we are. Like, we, we, we tell them that you made a mistake, it didn't hurt us, we're still here to help you get back up, right? So that personal growth plan process up through the uh, placement and then the availability and the, and the understanding that if in fact you, things don't go well, you can come back home, so to speak, and we can, we'll work with you. So that, that's how we've been focusing on it. Got it, thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Councilman Conway. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I um, want to thank you guys as well. I think um, you, you guys are really, 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 really important to all the work that needs to happen to support some of our most vulnerable residents, people who are on the edge. And I just want to echo my, my colleague's sentiments. Um, my, my question is, actually a little bit about staffing. I know one of the things we struggled with at the CAP centers was <clears throat> trying to get people hired um, during and after the pandemic or after, you get it. Um, I'm curious where we are with hiring now. Have we been able to fully staff up? What kind of vacancies are we looking at? So I'll start and then I'll send it over to Chris. So we have done robust recruiting and hiring uh, specifically for our CAP centers. Um, working with um, our, our HR department, and, and I can't thank my chief of staff enough as he's played dual roles uh, in this and uh, hiring our, um, our HSWs and our EPTs. And so uh, Chris is gonna let you know exactly where we are, but we have done a robust hiring, uh, fair uh, interviews and hiring. So Chris will be able to give you those exact numbers. 
Thank you, Dr. Brooks, and um, thank you, um, Mr. Conway. So starting on Monday, we actually have like 15 new staffers, um, a slew of EPTs, HSWs, ones to um, continue the good work that we're doing at the CAP Center. So we're always aggressively hiring. Uh, that, that's great to hear. Um, I know, um, and I think this is an issue we've been struggling across the whole city in different capacities. Um, uh, do we know how many vacancies we have at the moment? So before we had about 28, so we're down to about 13, give or take. Um, but we're constantly, I mean, our, our um, postings are evergreen, so they always stay up Good. Um, to continue to recruit. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I, I hope you guys continue to make headway on that. And um, yeah, anything we can do su to support to get those jobs out there, we certainly want to be able to help because your work is critical for people. Thank you. I just also want to add that I've been working very closely with Baltimore City Public Schools, um, also working uh, closely with their college and career readiness. Uh, we've had interns um, from uh, Baltimore City Public Schools, uh, as well as we're also receiving resumes from the most recent um, high school graduates, and we've also been partnering and working closely with Morgan and Coppin as well. So I just wanted to add that as well. That's good to know. Um, Vice President Middleton? No questions. Okay, guys, I'm going to break. Um, it's, it's just us three, so I'm going to break these rules. Um, Allie, uh, Ms. Smith, I got a few more questions about the guaranteed income pilot, obviously. Um, I want to know a little bit more about it. So um, just, to, just to start, um, uh, most of us in here know in 1994, HUD started the Move Into Opportunities Initiative. It was a randomized housing mobility initiative and experiment. Um, of course, as some of us remember, um, that happened in Baltimore and several other cities. It combined the use of rental assistance vouchers with intensive housing search and counseling services, and some may say did not provide enough additional assistance. So my question is, can you outline um, all of the wraparound services assistance that is being provided to the families within this pilot? Um, and when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about what DC also included within their pilot. So they gave weekly groceries, assistance securing other resources, unemployment insurance, financial literacy training, mental health support, um, and workforce training for people who wanted it. What are we offering um, outside of just um, the cash infusion? Thank you for the question. So a major tenet of guaranteed income is that it's this unconditional cash payment. So meaning that we can't have any requirements beyond the eligibility criteria for the participant. But during the onboarding process, we worked with um, partners across the city to develop a comprehensive resource reference packet. So while each participant was onboarded at the uh, cash campaign, they went through um, a litany of resources that are available for them to access with contact information, and they discuss that with them. So each participant has that as a reference, and they're able to reach out and ask for help in navigating any of those. But they're, because of the nature of the unconditional payment and that we're doing a randomized controlled trial evaluation, there isn't this requirement that they engage in any of the services, but when they were onboarded, they were introduced to what is available, and they have um, contact information for that. I know that it's not required. Do they have any um, case management that's going on outside of just providing them with the um, I don't want to say it just like this and just, and just simplify it like that, but just say giving a document or going through some training and saying, hey, this is available. Do they have case management um, reps who are still with them every step of the way? Yes. Staff at the Cash Campaign in Maryland are in regular contact 
with each of the participants, well, as much as they are willing to accept that, the contact and engagement. And out of the 200 participants, 178 of them opted to also go through benefits counseling during onboarding as well. Okay, I got one more um, question regarding this. This is going into that, that WYPR um, report that came out. It was mentioned, it was some key information that was provided um, within that, I think it was like a 20 minute um, report. And it spoke about the neighborhoods where a larger number of participants um, live within. And you know I paid attention because I heard two of mine when East Baltimore was mentioned, um, Bellet Edison in Northeast Baltimore, Highland Town in Southeast Baltimore. Um, I think they also mentioned a large amount of participants from um, Winter, Winter Hill or Winter, um, well let me not get it wrong. I mean, not to get the, get the neighborhood wrong. I do know Sandtown. I know Sandtown very well. So Sandtown and West Baltimore, they said it was a lot of participants. Um, I guess what I wanted to know is that since we know that a larger number of participants are coming from these already defined neighborhoods like Bella Edison, like Highland Town, um, how is, um, and Dr. Brooks, I don't know if this is something for you as well, but how is MOCFS um, utilizing that information, the information that we have right now, to proactively deploy assistance in those neighborhoods outside of this pilot? So if we know that a lot of these families or percentages going through food insecurity and they're concentrated within these certain neighborhoods, how are we being proactive about getting those resources out with the information that we do have. So I can start. So we're definitely using uh, the dashboard that we have stood up, even um, in with our EVP uh, and our CAP centers, where we have a, a dashboard where we can look at within each district to be able to show where the assistance is. Um, have also partnered with uh, community-based um, organizations, one being Harbell. Uh, where we work very closely with food distribution, um, also local churches, so we know when their food distributions are, so we can link um, up with them and partner with them to make sure that we are able to let our constituents know. Uh, also using that data to inform uh, some of the re reimagining work that I talked about earlier around financial literacy, maternal health and uh, care for our families, senior services that we also want to stand up because we know um, that a lot of our seniors were not able to engage with some of the resources. Um, so we're using the data to inform how we are reimagining how we're getting services and resources out to our families and partnering with other organizations to make sure that we are touching all parts of our, our city in, in the way in which our diverse communities need that assistance. I appreciate your um, response and thank you again. Um, Council Member Burnett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is about um, the rental assistance. Um, so, and you may or may not have this, so if you don't, we'll just submit it as a formal request. Um, but how many uh, applicate, applicants are currently on the wait list for rental assistance, if you know? Um, and, they, and I guess the associated amount of um, support have they requested? So, um, total amount we're currently requested. Uh, it, and we ask this because um, on estimates from the United Way, uh, the 25 million or so would help about 8,000 families avoid eviction. Um, and we know that the, currently there's, I think, 5 million that was announced by the administration to support. So we're trying to see, um, how, are, is that 5 million gonna be enough, essentially, to meet the current demand uh, for rental assistance? So currently, we have about uh, 3,600 cases that are in the submitted status um, and about 5,300 cases uh, that are in the queue. Um, what we do know is about 50% of those cases are expected to be duplicate cases because that's what our data is finding, that we have duplicate, a number of duplicate cases where families had put in multiple uh, applications. Um, and so leaving um, what we're anticipating is about 44 
um, a little over 4,400 total uh, cases um, that we are still in the process of processing. Um, what we're finding is that in, during the month of May, our burn rate or what we were actually paying out was about 58,000 um, 58, um, per day um, as we were processing uh, the number of, of cases. Um, and so if we continue um, this rate, uh, and as we reduce um, our spending, the spending should last through the end of 2023, so through December. Um, this is why we are um, really uh, hoping that we will be able to get some additional support from the federal and from the state. And this is why um, I can't thank Angela enough as she is diligently reaching out um, to the federal um, for some additional funds. Um, Angela, did you wanna add anything? No, I think that was everything. So what's the new rule, Madam Chair? Can I ask another question? <laughs> hey, let's go. We breaking rules today. Okay. All right. Um, so the other was just, I think this is more of a, a BBMR question. I didn't see the additional resources referenced in the budget. Um, I don't know where, like the five million, where would that be reflected in the budget book? Thanks, sir. So um, three million is from our partners at um, DXCD um, through CDBG CV1 funding, um, and then another two million will come from the ARPA office. So, council, so councilman, those funds have already been appropriated elsewhere. You know, the ARPA dollars were already previously appropriated, so that's not why they're showing up in the, the CDBG funds have also previously been appropriated. Got it, okay. I had a couple more, but I'll save them for the next round, Madam Chair. Okay, Council Member Conway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I wanted to dig into uh, Service 741 and the performance metrics there. Um, they're, they're a little bit all over the place, and I'm curious what's going on. Um, I'll take one, for example, the number of participants enrolled in case management. Uh, that's fluctuated over the years. In 2019, we had it at 711. Uh, 2020, we had it at just over 1,000. 2021, it was at 52. 2022, at 65. And our target has been pretty constant at 2,000. Um, and you see, maybe not as egregious as this, but fluctuations all over the place. I'm curious what's going on here and um, how are we thinking about making sure that we have the ability and resources to meet our targets here? So I will begin and then I will ask um, Angela to, to assist. So as we know, um, with our Community Action Partnership, there are multiple um, services that we uh, support and provide, energy assistance, eviction prevention, as well as water for all. Um, and as we know for the water for all, we don't, uh, imp we don't uh, develop the policy, but we implement the services. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do wanna uh, speak to that there has been a, a uh, large effort around the eviction prevention. We've done a lot of work around eviction prevention. Mm -hmm. Um, we have uh, been um, assisting a great deal of families with the Water for All and even improving how we've been providing those services around the Water for All as well as the energy assistance. I know that we do have a new um, director around uh, energy assistance and I'll let Angela know about the new uh, structure that we put in place to be able to support that as well. Sure, so um, initially, pre-pandemic, um, which was also pre my tenure, the um, CAP Center focused more on case management. And um, as I was hired, uh, the goal was to kind of move more from the transactional work of CAP and do some transformational work around case management. However, there was the pandemic and um, 
since the pandemic, all of our work has been primarily focused on COVID response. Um, however, now that we are moving, quote unquote, out of the pandemic, we are looking to re-engage that uh, work. And so the numbers should stable out moving forward as we are not only focused on the um, COVID response in our work. And so as Dr. Brooks elevated, we recently hired a new um, energy assistance manager, uh, director who also has a uh, social work work background who will be helping to connect the um, constituents who come in just asking for energy assistance and they will be transferred to our case managers. And now that all of our human service workers are certified case managers through the School of Social Work, uh, University of Maryland, all of that work will kind of transition back to looking at um, reaching that performance stand on measure um, regularly and okay. consistently. Great, so I guess what I'm hearing is uh, during the pandemic, our focus shifted and now it's shifting back? Correct. Okay, um, good to know. As far as resources to execute on this, we talked about um, rental assistance a little bit earlier, uh, the chair talked about it. Um, any other pieces that we would need in order to meet the needs of folks that are coming into our CAP centers? So the primary focus is developing those partnerships. And so right now we also recently hired a uh, community outreach partnership manager who is working to stand up our two generational whole family model. Um, and that's gonna consist of having a committee of professionals um, from the city offices and out in the community. And they're gonna develop what that uh, process actually looks like and our case managers will implement. Uh, and then uh, sort of last piece on the performance measures here. Um, I, I noted that we removed or we're, we're removing the earned income tax credits received as a metric. Um, and I, I th that, that may be fine, I think, because we're, it sounds like we're not going to be doing so much of that in-house, but giving that to external partners. So it may not be uh, really applicable. But I do want to note um, one of the big efforts that um, uh, the governor is pushing now is um, child tax credits, and that is a key indicator here. Um, there's going to be a lot more money going out to families with children. Um, and so making sure that we have ways to connect people to those tax resources are going to be really important for keeping people out of poverty. Um, so I'm just, I don't know how we want to think about that. Um, if we want to work with partners to see who we can, I don't, I don't know what the answer is there, but just, you know, whatever we can do to keep folks out of poverty, I think is an obvious win. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We have been joined by Councilman Torrance and also Councilwoman Felicia Porter. Um, before we start with the next round, Councilman Torrance, um, the floor is yours if you have a question, if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Dr. Brooks and team. Um, my first round of questions were related to a CAP Center in West Baltimore. Just want to know how we as a council can support it, as well as your mobile CAP Center from weeks ago from meeting with you. Good morning. So, uh, yes, we have been uh, looking at how we can support uh, in West Baltimore. We have been looking at if we could stand up a mobile uh, CAP Center, knowing that there are some uh, families that are, are challenged with getting to the, the um, to some of the other CAP Centers, we are continuing to take that into consideration, looking to see where we can provide uh, those resources and supports. Also looking at um, neighboring schools where we can partner. We have been working with our um, community-based uh, school uh, staff to be able to uh, make sure that they also have the information that we provide in our CAP centers and working closely with them, but we're continuing to look at the options of a mobile CAP center so that we can make sure that we're touching uh, the West uh, Baltimore as well to provide those supports and services. Thank you. And that's included in this budget or would you require a budget enhancement? So um, thank you for the um, question. Councilman, so um, I think we do have the resources that we need at this point, um, but we are always looking to uh, make sure we can expand our, our, our scope in, in that area. 
Okay, so uh, my concern is, is that when I look at the map of where our cap centers are, there is a gap within mostly the seventh, uh, the eighth district, as well as in the ninth district, where we have a large portion of, and I'll say this, concentration of poverty that need to be looked at. Um, we have great community school coordinators, however, but we definitely need a center, right? And I think about co potentially co-locating or finding places where we can get the mobile center connected because, yeah, no offense, Madam Vice President, my residents have to travel all the way into the sixth district. <laughs> You're always welcome. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Travel all the way into the 6th District to get access to these resources. We've tried, even with my team, during street teaming, to actually provide the same information, but we're still finding that gap. So one of the things is I would will, I will be welcome to help with the administration to figure out how we can co-locate or find some other funding sources to get this up and running sometime this year, because at this point, it is urgent for West Baltimore. Thank you. Councilwoman Porter. Okay, we're going to start over. I have just a few questions, Dr. Bunley. I think these are for these would be for you. So, Service 109 highlights some um, providing staffing for multiple programs. Excuse me, providing staffing for multiple programs, including my brother's keeper, but not much much information has been released since um, 2021 from my brother's keeper. Um, my question is, what is the status of my brother's keeper? And that's my first one. My brother's keeper is definitely attached to boys and young men of color. Um, we have had change in leadership um, in terms of the structure, um, former uh, deputy mayor, who is now CAO, um, has <clears throat> I handed that off. We have the staff person in our office who is ready to continue to do the work. Um, but the way it's set up, we have to, their board, they have a board, and that board has to continue to work with the boys and young men of color um, entity, uh, the cabinet, and, and that has kind of, that process has been slow. Is the staffing that's within your office, is that dedicated to yeah, my brother's keeper? we have a keeper? dedicated individual okay. who works, who is a liaison between our office and works on and with the board. What, and this is my last question. Regarding. That's fine, that's fine. What plans or, strate or strategic actions have resulted from that initiative, from this initiative? Well, we, we know we have the plan for the boys and young men of color, and my brother's keeper individuals were a part of that plan. It's, it's a strong plan, the activation and rollout of it, given the, the, the squeegee initiative, because we're talking about some of the same people working around the same, on the same issues, because when you talk about boys and young men of color, um, when you looked at the squeegee initiative, they were boys and young men of color and some girls, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and so the work is, it's similar, the same people doing the same thing and, and kind of sort of the collaborative has taken somewhat of a priority, but the board, and I'll have to ask uh, my, our liaison, the frequency at which the board has been meeting um, and what that next thing is, and I could get back to you in terms of what the next piece of work is um, in terms of um, implementing the plan for my brother's keeper. Okay, I think I see, I see LCAO. Yes, uh, just one update. So we can actually provide the board or the council with our boys and young men of color strategic plan. Absolutely. And it's, and again, it outlines all of the work from the Squeegee Collaborative, the um, My Brother's Keeper, as well as the Boys and Young Men of Color Cabinet. I appreciate that, CAO Leach. Um, Nate, I can't see you back there, but if we can just get an official committee request um, for that plan. Dexter. Dexter? Okay. I see you, Dexter. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Bunley, I have one additional question for you. Yes, um, 
this is important. This one is important to me because a proactive engagement by Monsi is going to be um, completed within Frankfurt. Um, just when they rolled out the Peace Bus, the Peace Mobile, excuse me, at um, Frankfurt and Sinclair with the mayor that morning, there was a shooting that evening. So what I want to know um, from your office is do members of your team participate in Monsi stabilization responses? And if so, can you detail what the collaboration looks like? It, it's a mandate by the mayor <clears throat> that we collaborate across agencies, absolutely. Um, in terms of the response, they lead the response and we participate, we being the Mayor's Office of African American Male Engagement. In that response, what we do, we do a lot of partnership work. So what we do is talk to the partners that we think that will assist in the request of my colleague, in this case it still would be Ms. Jackson, how to best contribute to the need to support whatever the action is in terms of the response. CAO Leach, I don't, look, I got my glasses on, but I can't really see it. And I'm sorry, Dr. That's Bunley, okay. I'm gonna come right back to you. Um, put, okay, you're behind the lectern. Are you guys good with getting that plan back um, within a week? You can have it today. Okay. It's already done. Perfect. That's, that's, our, that's our timeline. Dr. Bunley, I, I heard you, I just kind of lost my thought and had to get that one out before I forgot that one. Um, specific, outside of, outside of say, um, say, being there, outside of connecting where, um, like generally partnership, like connecting partners, um, what would be your role? What would, what would, what, how, how can, your office partner with Monsi. A lot of the services sometimes they seem like they overlap, but can you detail like specifically maybe an example of when you had to um, maybe connect a certain organization or what you guys were able to do to complement their services or vice versa? Right, so for example, one of the things, the thought that I had in mind, uh, I was standing with the mayor at the announcement, it's going to be important when we have, for example, the bus in that area, it's going to be important that we have, in any of the areas where the bus is, that we mobilize individuals to be able to go to the spaces where the individuals are. We are big on being on the ground, being in space. So um, that would be, that's the, that's the suggestion as we roll this out um, the, 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 the Peace Mobile, having our partners, again, we're big on partnerships, having the partners do some proactive work on the ground. And so that would be my suggestion as the director of the Mayor's Office of African American Male Engagement to assist my colleague who would be rolling out the response from Monty. Colleagues, thank you for your patience. I just had one additional um, follow-up. Can you give me an example of some of these partners? Um, I know like in FY23 when I um, asked a similar question, during those hearings you spoke about we are us. Are there other partners? Um, can you give me some other names of some partners that you typically engage with? Absolutely. You have individuals, um, and, and, and I want to go back, um, Councilman McCray. One of the things that we are starting to do well is find our partners who have real interest in bodies of work. Um, the body of work of being on the ground, you have to have individuals who have that interest. What we also find in Baltimore is that you have individuals who have that interest, but they have overlapping work. So for example, you mentioned we are us. We have individuals in there and they love doing that work. But you also have uh, Baltimore Brothers. We were just at a graduation with the mayor of 45 young people, but these were 
younger individuals, right? Love doing that work. You have, so that's Baltimore Brothers. You have the peace team, all right? These are individuals who are credible individuals who have, um, uh, do a lot of community work. They, they had a softball game, not recently, and I saw the council. Did you hit a home run or did you strike out, sir? I pulled a muscle. Okay, <laughs> so, but you have the peace team. But again, um, Councilwoman McCray, you have individuals who will do that work. And so our goal is to continue to expand individuals who have that interest to, to who are willing to go do that work. So there are other individuals, but again, these are individuals who love doing that work because a lot of people don't like being in that space. They don't feel comfortable being in that space. Dr. Bunley, I appreciate your responses to my questions. Um, we're going to go to, and we have been joined by one of my favorite colleagues, um, Councilman Stokes. We are going to go to Councilwoman Porter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Brooks, I did have a quick question about food insecurity. As you're aware, um, it's a very big issue all across the city. And I know that during COVID, your office kind of led the effort with the food distribution efforts um, in 16 sites. Can you speak to what we're going to do to kind of expand that or keep that service, that essential service as is throughout the city? Yes. So what we've been doing is we've been partnering with other um, nonprofits as well as uh, local churches to find out when their food distributions are. We've been sharing that information with constituents. We've also uh, been uh, reaching out um, to, and I'll have Angela speak to it, um, because we also are standing up where we're also going to be distributing uh, food as well. So Angela, if you could speak to that, please. Yes, um, the CAP centers also receive a uh, grant from the Maryland Food Emergency Program. And so recently, um, within the last month, we partnered with community schools and my colleague to my right um, with Baltimore City Head Start, and we distributed um, over 1,200 food boxes. Thank you, I appreciate that response. Are you all coordinating um, in any effort with the United Way, Maryland 211, so that the efforts are at least kind of combining together as opposed to duplicative? We have not, but we're happy to in the future. Okay, I definitely recommend that. 211 is kind of the intentional hub for those resources down in South Baltimore, and I know that would be a very big effort, um, and it can coordinate a lot of the resources that's happening all across the city. My second question actually has to do with um, some I'm trying to frame my words appropriately, um, SNAP benefits. We've been noticing a lot of fraudulent cases as it relates to SNAP benefits. Can you speak to how the CAP centers are coordinating those efforts with, um, with, you know, you know, with the resident, but also um, so that they can get those emergency resources needed? So we work closely with Department of Social Services um, that issues those SNAP benefits. When a constituent comes in and shares that information, we do reach out to our point of contact um, to be able to uh, make sure we are first messaging the correct information. We want to also always make sure that we're messaging the correct information, but then also uh, making sure that we're pointing the constituent in the right direction. We also are very diligent in not just sending constituents off without uh, giving them some place to go and someone to talk to. Um, that is uh, an expectation that we have set for, for all of our CAP centers. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I wanna just highlight the work of Tammy May. She has been absolutely amazing um, with regards to being assistance to us on the council. Um, but I am slightly concerned that given that we have some of the CAP centers that have from um, Vice President Middleton, she shares some of the historical knowledge of, of how some of those CAP centers actually kind of uh, consolidated. Um, we just need to do a better job of like pushing that information out and having that information out in more neighborhoods than just strictly at the CAP Center. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go um, for a follow-up to VP Middleton. And then we're going to go to Councilman Stokes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick um, idea question. Um, the HIPPIE program, and I know that um, the squeegee 
uh, collaboration and working with those young men. And some of those young men have children. And I don't know if there was, has been a discussion on trying to get them uh, at least their foot in the door with some connection with the hippie program in helping them and educating them to also be connected as a parent connected with the school and helping them to be, you know, th that step in helping them to be good fathers as well, I think is a, is a, a good idea. I don't know if you've had that conversation. It, um, Tracy Estep always does a great scan of the services that we have across our agencies. And so when we look at an individual, we not, not only look at that individual, uh, but we look at that individual needs. And so the scan, so I'm sure Tracy is taking that into consideration right now because we're looking at individuals and then bringing all the resources to bear that they need, particularly the ones that are available in the city. Thank you for that. You have a follow up with that? Um, I do. I'm just gonna wait for the chair to recognize it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hop back to you. Let me get the council, Ms. Stokes. He's been waiting over there. Then we're gonna come right back to you, Councilman Torrance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I, I know um, to Dr. Buntley, to your your office, man. Y'all go in the neighborhood. There's nobody else will go in. Really, um, Ms. Whitaker, your office is great. I don't care what people say. Y'all had that money for people that need um, rental assistance and you spent every dime. So no people can't say you had money left over. Jamon, y'all do a great job. But you know, y'all do the kind of work nobody wants to do. We know that in here. And I know a lot of times people always say, you're not doing this, you're doing that. But I want to acknowledge the fact Tracy, Dr. Buntley, DeMond, Ms. Whitaker, y'all do a yeoman's job in the city, and I know sometimes y'all don't get that back, but I just want to share that with you. But I also wanted to mention, and I'm, I'm happy about this, so I know we talk about um, food does it. I've been working hard along with our senator, and we can really open up a market in the 12th district or across from Dunbar High School, but we need a lot more markets. You know, we, we need a lot more programming for our young people. I know I was in here one day and my uh, colleague said, don't say we don't have enough rec centers. She straightened me out real quick. So I'll never say that again. But we have to have some program for these young people. And I ain't talking about the ones that we see go to school, do everything. The ones that need some extra hand holding, some aftercare, and I've been advocating with Rec and Parks and administration, that we have to put more money in programming in our rec centers. And I say it all the time, everybody don't play football and basketball. STEM ain't nothing but science. We need to sit down with our young people and find out what they want, and they won't walk past a rec center to go to the harbor. They go to the harbor because you know how many rec centers they walk past? So all the work that y'all do in feeding people and hand holding and make sure our young people to follow the right path. I just want to thank you guys for it. I know y'all don't always get acknowledged, but I always talk very highly of you guys and the work that y'all put in. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilman uh, Torrance. Madam Chair, may I just share something very of quickly? Of course. Um, the program that we just were a part of over in East Baltimore at the Oliver Center, um, uh, Councilman Stokes was very much a part of it, wasn't able to make it through but the individuals were shit, talked about the support that you had given to even make that program go off for those 45 young boys who have been in a program for an entire year. We didn't do it. We're partnering with Baltimore Brothers, again, one of those entities that loves doing that work. And so the collaboration piece, and I can't say it enough, I'm so thankful for, my, for our CAO and her mindset to collaborate. Right, that is going to be it. Anytime we are trying to tackle an issue, find and corral those individuals who are interested in that particular issue, and we're gonna be able to get it done because you don't waste time when you have individuals who are specifically interested. So I wanted to, um, to share that, and, and, and it was stated in your absence, um, Councilman Stokes, about your participation and to make that program go off for those 45 young people. A lot of flowers today, I like it. 
Councilman Torrance. I'm just going to keep it going. So I just want to um, refer back to Dr. Brooks and discuss the guaranteed income pilot because I think it highlights the coordination amongst Dr. Bunley's office as well as our other city agencies in terms of getting to the root of helping our most disadvantaged community members. So can you give us an update on the guaranteed income pilot? Good morning, council member. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll run through a quick timeline update and then if you have follow-up questions from that. Okay, so the we launched a live application for participants in May 2022. We received over 4,000 applications during that one week period. Enrollment and benefits counseling with the Cash Campaign of Maryland went through June and our monthly cash payments began August 15th. Since August, monthly payments have been successfully delivered to participants without any challenges. And some exciting news in early April, the state granted a waiver to guaranteed income participants for income for programs such as SNAP, temporary cash assistance, and others. Before the pilot launch, we had received a waiver for, from the Housing Authority of Baltimore City for housing vouchers. Um, the program's research component includes qualitative and quantitative research done by APT Associates and Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Our first batch of quantitative surveys were sent out in January and February, and final reports on outcomes will be released in 2024 and then in 2025. Any personal stories that we can learn about participants? Because I, I just want to make sure the public understands who is benefiting from this program, because it's often lost about who are the actual participants as well. Sure. I ran through a few earlier, but would love to highlight them again. So during our onboarding process, the nonprofit administrator cash campaign helped 40 people open a bank account. They helped eight people set up an email for the first time. Uh, since the onboarding process, we've collected stories from, from participants that have improved their housing and working circumstances. For example, we had a mother, we have a mother in the program who was working three part-time positions when the pilot began and now she has secured a full-time position in a field that she actually wants to pursue so she's able to work in a field she's passionate about and have more time for her family. We had 26 participants who identified as unhoused when the program began and we have confirmed that those in the cohort have found secure housing and we had stories of participants that were unstably housed too, where they may have been living with family members or couch surfing and have secured housing or been able to find housing that's more appropriate for their needs, like a participant who was living in a one bedroom with three children and has now moved to a two bedroom apartment. And then we have some more unique stories too, in which one participant has always wanted to become a flight attendant and she's been able to enroll in classes because of the income she's receiving from the pilot. And then we've also heard just testimony from many of them about how they feel that it's had a positive impact on their, on their mental health. Now hear me. I just want to make sure the public understands that while we were giving these payments to people, it changed their lives and impacted them in different ways that we may take as for granted. That extra money each month is time with children time to actually pursue a career that you want, as well as provide you the opportunity to have housing that's adequate to you. Now, my next question for you is next steps in terms of sustainability as a city. We know that these funds will expire. How are we planning to work with our nonprofit partners and others so we can continue to lift up persons for the next cohort if we do have one? In terms of future planning and what we've done so far, we've begun planning for the offboarding process with participants, meaning helping them prepare for what it looks like when this income stops so that they're prepared for that. And we're also hoping that the, like I spoke to the evaluation earlier, so we're hoping that we are able to see things there such as impact on mental health, time spent with children, decisions made around childcare, and be able to use that for advocacy for policy on a state or national level for um, programs like a guaranteed income. 
Um, so with that being said, I would like a committee request on a briefing about how do we move forward with after all after offboarding persons, how do we discuss potentially on another pilot to again lift up another set of families? Absolutely. Thank you. Councilman Torrance, I'm sorry. What was was that a committee request? Yes, ma'am. One to a briefing on the offboarding of the current families and then discussion of potentially doing another pilot with additional families. Briefing on offboarding and then a discussion about how do we potentially continue an additional pilot. Um, reasonably by August 1st. So just to recap, officially, a briefing on yes. a pilot and also sustainability? Yes. On how we can continue and by August the 1st. Okay, we're good. Council Member Burnett. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, how many of the employees that work in the CAP centers uh, speak Spanish? Um, and as a follow-up, um, those that don't speak Spanish, how many have been trained to use the language line? Currently, we have five employees that speak Spanish, and all of our staff have been um, trained on how to use the language line in addition to uh, software that helps with translation. Awesome. Um, and I guess just taking a step back broadly, um, what are the, the top issues that people are coming to the CAP centers for? Like, are there trends that, um, that sort of have evolved, evolved over time? Are you seeing patterns? Like, what are, I guess, what are you seeing right now, I guess, coming out of the sort of peak of the, of the pandemic? Um, I think because of what the CAP centers are known for publicly, um, they come to our CAP centers for rent assistance, water assistance, or energy assistance. And then what we're moving to is it being incumbent upon our staff to kind of take deeper dives and figure out what additional services the constituents need. And sorry, this is a quick follow-up on that, Madam Chair. Um, the on that, I guess the so you're I guess sort of moving to more it's more of a case management model. Um, so I guess in the in the budget book, the some of the performance measures are low on that front. Is that like because of staffing, or what are some of the the causalities of that? Currently, they're low because um, we have been focused strictly on COVID response. And so because the numbers were so high, we did not have the capacity to engage um, case management. We had to full on press on keeping individuals housed and um, with electricity. Got it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman Conway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this line of questioning is uh, for the um, Office of Af African, -American, African American Male Engagement, uh, Dr. Bunley. Um, I want to circle back to the Squeegee Collaborative, and I'm, I'm really curious about um, like what we know by way of how it's gone. Um, for instance, how many young people have we engaged? Uh, and do we know, I, I think we've seen um, some, signif some significant um, changes on the key corners that we've been focused on. Um, have we seen folks pop up in other corners? Do we have any information on that? Thank you for the question, Councilman Conway. The, I did, there was a slide earlier, I, I think it was, I was done before you came in, <clears throat> when we talked about, I talked about the categories of individuals that we engage, and they mm -hmm. fall into two categories. They are school age young people, and then our non-school age young people. And we always, we start with a target of individuals we want to proactively engage. And so just the, the, the data that we have, I don't know if I could. Well, I, I think it is it up there. Here. Yeah, it's just smaller. Is that, yeah. Yes. So yes, if you look at you know, FY 2022, we talked about the number of youth enrolled and engaged in our Connect to Success program. That's the umbrella. Mm -hmm. where the squeegee initiative is housed. Uh, we targeted 100 individuals. Uh, we were able to actually engage 140. Um, 
the number of youngsters currently attending school or work. And again, that's usually the school or the school age youth or work mm -hmm. or the non-school age youth. We had a target of, uh, again, 100. Uh, we ended up getting 101. Um, we talked about the youth um, attending school slash work, engage, and achieve uh, two or more of their personal, pro, uh, personal growth plan goals. We talked about, uh, again, individuals. We don't bring individuals into our process. Upstream is this personal growth plan process. That is where we help them to articulate what they want to be and then all some of the issues that they have. So if you look at that, we have basically um, engaged those individuals, um, and that's the process. As it pertains to the corners, what we've learned in the process, Councilman, is that <clears throat> when you see the reduction of individuals on corners, they are individuals who, that when those individuals are now in different places, they're not squeegeeing, they have an alternative to squeegeeing, mm -hmm. the money and the, the, the venue, right? Some individuals, again, they are just not ready. So what they do is that they do pop up in other places. Um, we're right now, and I can use something that we're doing specifically right now, on Martin Luther King Boulevard, which was rough, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a meeting this Friday. Uh, uh, Deputy, De De Deputy Mayor uh, DeRaza responded um, to an email that I sent out about how we're going to focus on two particular groups. We have minors under the age of 14. Now, the ones that are 14, the, the question for, from the Deputy Mayor was, what can we do for the ones who are 14 and above, and how can we get them involved in the summer program. So we're working on that. They're 14 and above, so we can do And this that. is in partnership with Monsi? Well, all, everything that we do, we have to, that's the directive from the mayor. Okay. We have to do it in partnership. But this particular piece that we're doing, it's in partnership with the police department. Mm -hmm. It's in partnership with uh, Monsi. It's in partnership. So we work in partnership. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working at that. But we also are looking at the youngsters who are minors under the age of 14, and they just popped up now that school is over. Right. Right? So we have to individualize and, and deal with that. So the process is, is really about street outreach workers. It's about the collaborative, the police, street, street outreach workers, and what we have to do with the minors. But we also have to do the same thing when the data comes in. We're now having to disaggregate when a call comes in. Is it a squeegee youth? because we have to use the idea of panhandling because because we can't single out squeegee youth right. we can't sing because that's discrimination we're right. talking about panhandlers so we're looking at disaggregating that and looking at some of the calls that are coming in from Martin Luther King yes it's about panhandlers but specifically unhoused individuals so we're working that out right in in con in, in collaboration with my colleague at MOHS so um the process is there. When they pop up, we do the same thing. When we get MLK right, then it's replicable in other places because you begin to see the same kind of phenomenon move to different places. Yep, and just one additional thing that I'll add. So we actually have a weekly data report um, that will become public, I think either next week or the following week. Um, but since we've launched the collaborative, we've actually, well, at first we were meeting every day. Uh, and now we meet about um, two to three times a week and we review data that OPI um, actually um, pulls for us. And so when we look at the data at this time, uh, this year, in comparison to this time last year, we're seeing a 73% reduction in calls for service. Um, and we're also seeing a significant decrease in criminal activity just over, uh, just over the past, uh, January. yeah, since week, looking at my data report I have here since week 12, we've actually had no um, instances of criminal activity. Um, but again, I can provide this data report to the council as a part of our submission. 
that would be great. And we also, and what you'll see in this report is we actually also track where activity is and where activity shifts. Um, so we have a heat map that indicates where we are receiving calls for um, service. That, that would be phenomenal. And I, I, I think it would be helpful, um, I don't want to make this a, a request, but I do think it would be helpful um, if we draw up our lessons in, in like a two-pager of sorts, like what we learned over the course of the year since we rolled this out uh, to inform, because squeegeeing is not going to go away. These issues are not going to go away. They're going to continue, and new people will be in these seats, and we want to know what you guys are learning through this process so that we know how to deal with it and where we made mistakes and where we had major successes. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Very well. I was on the whole time. We're coming up on the end of this hearing, so um, colleagues, we're going to be very mindful. If you do have a question, um, we're going to keep it very brief. Any comments, we're going to keep it very brief, and we're down to one comment or one question. Councilman Stokes. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's just for Dr. Buntley. You know, I work closely with Todd Scott with his We Rise program. And we actually go over to those facilities and talk to them young men. I think that would be a, a great opportunity. I'm working with um, Secretary Scruggs, who is now the division, um, Secretary of Division of Corrections here in Baltimore. Never happened for a black woman to have that position, and that's a good resource that we need to be talking to. But I wondered, my question was, are you talking with um, Todd Scott with the We Rise program? because we actually go there. We have a young man now, he's working at the Pendry, doing very well, been there a whole year, but guess what? He lived in the city, he didn't even know where the Pendry was. He didn't even know where Fells Point was, because our kids never get an opportunity to, to get out of the neighborhood. So to Dr. Bonnie, I'd like to put you with Todd Scott to work with you on what he's doing, what we're doing also. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll be in touch with him, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Colleagues, do we have any other questions? Councilman Torrance. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is more so a request to the administration. Um, while we've been focused on squeezing it, I just want to inherently say that we make a shift as well because I still believe in our young people's First Amendment rights, but I just want to shift to the fact that we need to have a plan around panhandling in general, especially at those intersections because those persons don't look like me and are being inherently treated different and becoming a nuisance in certain neighborhoods. So we don't get the calls for service for squeegeeing, but there are still panhandlers who are actually violating the law, unlike our young people. I just wanna make sure we be equally handed that way as well. Thank you for that, council member. So I, I do wanna be clear that although uh, we talk about the squeegee collaboratives plan, the plan talks about panhandling in general and not just um, squeegeeing because of course, our law department um, was very clear that we have to address the totality of the issue and not single out a particular population. I think when we talk about MLK Boulevard in particular, we're at MLK and Howard in particular, we see a number of squeegee workers as well as panhandlers. And so I think that's the partnership that Dr. Bunley was talking about um, that he's forging with the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services to ensure that we're doing outreach to not just connect squeegee workers with opportunity, but also the those individuals who choose to panhandle. So we have two last, um, we're gonna go to VP Middleton and then we're gonna go to Council Member Burnett to close us out. Um, VP Middleton. Uh, and thank you for that statement, C.A. Leach, and also um, my colleague, Councilman uh, Torrance, but I uh, just want to also um, and if there is an update on that, I know we're getting ready to also incorporate our Office of Aging. And just, you know, of course we're focused on our youth, but I want to know if there is going to be or has been some intergenerational uh, efforts because our older adults as well um, really need to be a part of what's going on and also helping them. So if, we, if there's any efforts that we need to know about uh, within this office, uh, please share. 
Thank you for that. So yes, um, the uh, CAP centers, as we reimagine re the work at the CAP centers, we are focusing um, our efforts on providing and standing up additional resources for our seniors, uh, working collaboratively with that new office that is standing up to be able to go out uh, to our senior centers, uh, also hearing from our seniors what additional supports they need. Uh, also, I'm gonna let Angela talk a little bit about our new position that we have stood up and that work that we're doing to support our seniors as well. Yes, so again, um, we have um, reclassed the pen to create a position that is strictly focused on um, community partnerships and community outreach as a manager. And then we also have um, about four case managers who's going to be supporting that work as well. And so as a part of that, um, Tammy Maids will be working with the Office of Aging to kind of create opportunities for us to hear from that department and from our senior adults on what they need. And then like Dr. Brooks said, we will actually have human service managers and our energy technicians go out into the centers, into the community to take those services um, on the road, so to speak, so that they don't have to figure out where to go and how to navigate their needs. Thank you so much for that update. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Councilman Burnett to close us out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so just a quick follow-up on the, uh, the rental assistance piece. Um, so we know that a lot of, for a lot of our families, um, they don't just, the, the financial hardships just don't resolve overnight. Um, do you know how many emergency rental assistance applications have been repeat requests? So not like multiple family members sending it in at the same time, but like someone that may have gotten rental assistance at one point and then they're coming back for either rental assistance or some other uh, service. Um, well, on that end. So I don't have that number with me. We can get that number uh, to you. I don't okay. have that right here at hand. Okay. All right. And I, I guess that would just put that as a request, Madam Chair. So, um, folks that have um, been sort of repeat, not necessarily uh, duplicates, but like they've received assistance and then they're coming back um, again to receive assistance, and I guess in the last fiscal year. Do you have a um, timeline for when you need that information back, Councilmember Burnett? Okay. Uh, yeah, a week. Uh, so that would, I don't have my calendar in front we, of me. But by next Monday, would that be? Okay. For Nathan and Dexter, did you guys get that request? Are you guys good? Okay. okay. Look, I'm trying to be proactive about this timeline. He said a week. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, this hearing is going to be in recess. We will be back in about three to four minutes to hear from the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services. Thanks again. <laughs>